Hey there folks, welcome to the studio. Today we're going to be talking about etching steel, aluminum, and zinc based metals. Um, and we're going to be doing it with a chemical etch. This chemical etch solution is uh, relatively easy to mix up. It really only contains two ingredients besides water and um, it's relatively non-toxic. It still has some toxicity to it, but with most chemical etches that we're familiar with, we're often using things like ferric nitrate um, and other substances that are, that are pretty harsh, not only to the environment, but uh, also just make a mess in the studio as well as hazardous to, to our potential health. So um, what I'm gonna show you today, like I said, is relatively easy as well as cuts down on the toxicity of things. So let's get started. First thing you're gonna need are some ingredients. So I'm gonna include a little list of things right here. And if there's a place to put a link, I'll also put a link um, to a written form of all of that so that you can look that up on your own time. Um, but that way you'll have it available to you so that you can mix up on your own without having to go back and rewatch this. All right, now that you got the ingredients, why don't we bring them out and we'll talk a little bit about them and then how to mix them up. Now that was awesome, because here we are. This is everything you're gonna need. Um, let's first talk a little bit about safety. Uh, the stuff that we're gonna be mixing up, uh, the, like I said, the main ingredient is going to be this copper sulfate, which is also root killer. It is uh, slightly toxic uh, to your skin, and so you don't want to ingest this, obviously, so don't be eating this, don't be drinking it, but don't get it on your skin as well. So um, what you're gonna wanna do is make sure you've got some nice nitrile gloves nearby or some rubber gloves. Um, the reusable ones that you, you use to clean with uh, will work just fine. Um, so uh, also make sure that you wear eye protection when you mix everything as well as it, during the etching process itself. And then also because you're gonna be mixing up fine particulate, uh, particularly this copper sulfate that, that you should really shouldn't be ingesting, um, you're gonna want to also have a respirator on hand. So make sure you've got those things. All right, now everything else that you're gonna need like I said, is, is right here. So this is the copper sulfate. It's these sort of blue crystals that you'll find in the hardware store um, or in your farming supply store. I'll get a little close there so you can see. These sort of uh, blue crystals here are um, a little more coarse. You could find it really ground up and fine um, or coarse. Either way, it'll be work just fine. The coarser ones, um, just take a little bit longer to dissolve, but uh, I'm gonna show you a trick when it comes to mixing this stuff that it's gonna solve that issue anyways. Um, any kind of table salt will work just fine. Uh, I get the stuff from the grocery store shelf. Iodized is just fine as well. I buy it in bulk um, if I can find really large bags of it and then I just keep it in buckets and then just uh, dish out whatever I need as I go along. Um, it's a one-to-one -one solution, so just remember that. Whatever you're going to use of this, uh, make sure that the same amount in terms of weight of that uh, salt uh, to copper sulfate solution is, is equal, and then you don't have anything to worry about. Honestly, you don't even have to worry about the directions that I'm going to give you because as long as whatever you weigh in this you weigh out the exact same amount of this, and again, just keep it to that one-to-one -one solution, you're golden. So that's all you need to worry about. The other things that you're gonna need are some clean, empty buckets. I like to have a couple different sizes, as well as a five-gallon bucket um, to mix up your main batch of solution in if you're gonna be mixing up a bigger batch like I am today. Um, and then you're gonna want some plastic containers that you're actually gonna do the etching in. And I didn't have those uh, sitting up here with me. Here they are right here. So we're gonna do a few small etchings along with a larger three-dimensional etching. So just some small plastic containers work fantastic for those, those small etches. Um, then, uh, yeah. Make sure that you've got some sort of solvent. I like to use acetone just because it evaporates very quickly, but this solvent is what you're gonna clean the surfaces of your metal with. So the trick with this etching is that you wanna make sure that you choose you know, the selective areas that you want to stand up and out. 
And you do that by creating a resist in whatever design or pattern that you're going to utilize to create that design. Um, so anything that resists the liquid of that etching solution is going to make that surface sort of stand up and out while everything else gets etched around it. So you want a solvent to clean your metal surfaces with because even just touching that metal surface with your fingers, leaving a little bit of oily residue behind, will create enough of a resist that sometimes that can actually impede your etching process or leave little blemishes within the design itself that you might not want. So make sure you've got some sort of cleaning solvent nearby to help clean that metal with. Um, we've got a scale that we're going to measure everything out with. And then when it comes to um, this demo, I'm going to be doing a plate, um, just a small plate of aluminum. This is 6062 alloy, just a small plate of mild steel. And then I've done a, a cast iron um, casting of a human skull. And what we're going to do is try to do a three-dimensional etching utilizing this object here. And then what I'm going to etch, uh, you can utilize a lot of different things. Again, it's just whatever can, can adhere to the surface of that metal and not lift off during that etching process so that as that um, chemical starts to eat away the exposed surfaces of the metal and starts to etch down into it, the things that are covered with some sort of a resist that doesn't get exposed to that etching solution is what's going to remain raised on that surface. So anything that you can find that will not wash away um, and resist that sort of etching solution is fantastic to use um, in terms of creating that, that design and that surface on, on your, your metal object. So some things, some examples that I like to use uh, are uh, these paint markers. These are fantastic. They work really well. So um, you can again buy these at most uh, art supply stores as well as some hardware stores. Make sure you shake them up really well, but then it's like a Sharpie, but it actually applies uh, its, its marks in paint. Um, and then make sure that it dries really well. Once it dries, that is fantastic and it resists the, the whole etching process really well. Um, and then once the etching process is done, you just remove this again with your acetone or some sort of solvent and it just takes that away and then you've got your metal surface back again. Uh, fingernail polish works fine. The problem with fingernail polish is you just gotta wait a little longer for it to dry, but once it dries, it works really nicely. So that's something that you can utilize. Um, and then tape, uh, so I'm gonna be using duct tape because that's what I'm gonna back the back of our metal with so to make sure that we don't etch the, the back of it while, cause I'm all, all I'm interested in is uh, etching the front of it for, for this demo. So I'm gonna protect the back of it with um, duct tape. That's, that's a really quick nitty gritty way to make sure that you just don't um, etch that back area. And this is, you know, will withstand the etching process enough that um, this doesn't get saturated, it doesn't fall off. It's, it's good enough for, for that process. So get you some duct tape. Um, but you can also use masking tape or anything like that. Uh, but again, be careful, and again, be careful with what you're etching when it comes to aluminum. Remember how aggressive it is. It it's definitely um, sort of agitates that, that uh, chemical solution. It bubbles, it fizzes, it generates hydrogen gas as it does that. And that sort of off-gassing and agitation can, some, can sometimes lift uh, that uh, resist material that you're using to create your design if it's not adhered well enough to the surface of your metal. So masking tape will work just fine as long as it's down and as long as it's not for any sort of long-term etching. Eventually that masking tape will lift off. But you can carve designs into that masking tape or any sort of tape um, and then uh, with an X-Acto blade or something like that and then lay that down onto your surface and that will give you that transfer of that design in the negative. Now what I'm gonna do with this project, and I'm not gonna go into this too in-depthly uh, because it would be a whole nother demo that I can give later, but I'm gonna actually be using designs that I've cut on a vinyl cutter. So a vinyl cutter becomes an incredible tool when it comes to this to solution, uh, excuse me, this process, because it allows you to take uh, these machines, sort of very intricate, digitally cre um, generated designs and then be able to put that onto your metal surfaces and create that precision 
uh, that that only you might be able to get from a, a machine or a computer. Um, and so it's really easy because it just car, uh, cuts it out in terms of a sticker, and that vinyl sticker adheres really nicely to the metal, and that it's uh, really durable to withstand that whole etching process and not lift off for the most part. So so um, durable, in fact, that some of these designs that I'm doing, this is wallpaper patterns that I've been doing a series of work um, etching into uh, various metal tools and metal objects. And um, you can see in terms of scale of my finger and some of the things on that design, you can see some of those little cutouts are so, so tiny, you know, maybe uh, a sixteenth of an inch to three thirty seconds of an inch little pieces. And those can adhere well enough to the metal and not lift off that you still get a really clean etching from that process. Um, so these are all, again, vinyl cutouts, just stickers. Uh, I've got uh, some, um, some transfer tape that I've already laid across these. And so that's how I lift these stickers off of their backing. And then I've got that transfer tape that I'll then put back over to the surfaces of our objects here and then peel that transfer tape off. And that's how I get a clean transfer onto our objects. And then once I do that, and uh, that's after, again, I've cleaned these uh, um, surfaces with our uh, solvent to make sure there's no oils or anything on them. Um, and then once the sticker gets applied to it, then it goes into the etching solution. And then it's just a matter of waiting for that chemical etch to etch around whatever design I've got and then we'll take it out, we'll wash it off, and we're good to go. Oh, and that reminds me, there's one more thing that you're gonna need. So we've got our buckets, and we, we're gonna do our mixing here in just a second with our ingredients. Um, the last thing that you're gonna need to do is make sure that you've got a bucket of clean water nearby so that once you pull your object out of your etching solution, you can then dunk it into a, a clean bucket of water so that you can then just wash off that etching solution. You want to make sure you get off all that etching solution as quickly as you can because it will continue to etch. It can also leave you know, a little bit of corrosion. The salts will dry on it. It'll continue to etch over time. So you just want to make sure you get that completely clean and scrubbed off. And then um, when, to finish it off, you, you'll just seal it with some sort of sealant um, or some sort of wax or something like that, uh, like you would seal any sort of metal with. Um, so just make sure you get your, uh, a nice clean bucket of water to dunk everything into and wash it off after you're done. All right, so let's talk about how to mix everything. It's really easy. Uh, again, um, the, ing the ingredients and the directions that I provided previously to you, if you just follow that, uh, you're, you're good to go. But the one thing to remember is it's just a one-to-one -one solution and uh, in terms of weight versus your copper sulfate and your salt. So as long as you follow that, you can deviate from those directions that I gave you and you'll be just fine. So if you do a pound of this, do a pound of this. If you do 500 grams of this, do 500 grams of this. So again, whatever weight you've got in copper sulfate, then you just do the same weight in salt. And then you can honestly just mix whatever amount of water you want into it you can make it super concentrated and then it'll just be incredibly aggressive. It'll etch very quickly, but it also gives you a little bit uh, more aggressive of an etch in terms of the texture it's gonna leave. Um, so you just be careful about that. But it, uh, it honestly doesn't matter. What we're gonna do today is we're going to mix up uh, a thousand grams of our copper sulfate. We're gonna do a thousand grams of our table salt and then we're going to mix that with five liters of hot water just out of the tap. Um, and then we're going to make sure that that stirs up and dissolves everything really well. So that's the trick is just make sure that you get the water as hot as you can possibly get it. Uh, you might even want to add a little boiling water, whatever. Um, and make sure that all those crystals get really, really dissolved. So that's with your first five liters of water. Then you're going to add an additional five liters of uh, water that's just room temperature or maybe a little cooler um, and that'll just sort of balance out that temperature get everything to room temperature if the solution is too hot again it will etch faster on in terms of your metal that's not necessarily a bad thing but when it comes to sort of predicting the timing that you're going to need for this whole process or just getting 
you know, a, a nice clean etch. I like to just have my solution at room temperature. So when it comes to mixing, that hot water trick is perfect when it comes to melting all of your, your crystals and your particulate. But then once that's all melted, your second bucket of five uh, liters of water, again, that's why it's cooler. It's just to kind of balance everything out to room temperature. Let's get mixing. All right, so I got our scale set up here. Got us a clean bucket to put our ingredients into. And the first thing we're gonna get uh, started with is weighing out our ingredients. Now don't forget, um, it is a one-to-one -one solution. So we're gonna go one part copper sulfate, one part table salt. And with this uh, amount that I'm mixing up right now, we're gonna go with a thousand grams of copper sulfate and then a thousand grams of table salt. So we're gonna just turn on our scale here, make sure it's on grams, zero out our scale, and then again, just go ahead and add our ingredients a little bit at a time. Make sure you're wearing your safety equipment while you do this, your respirator, so you don't breathe this in. These larger crystals aren't so bad but particularly if you're using the really fine, fine ground crystals, you're going to want to definitely wear your respirator. Okay. Get a little back there. Oh, so close. Perfect. Ah, oh, a little over. Doesn't really matter, honestly. Um, just get as close as you can. Uh, but the key is to make sure you get the same amount of table salt once we get this. All right, so I'm going to toss this into our big bucket, and then I'll come back and do the salt. Okay, now for our salt. Doesn't matter what kind of salt you use. I just use table salt. I get a big bag from the grocery store and just... Uh, keep a, a ready supply of it here in this bucket. Um, this is just iodized salt. Uh, it really doesn't matter what kind you use. We're gonna go for the same amount, 1,000 grams. Oh, too much. Put a smidge back there. Pretty good, close enough. All right, now we're gonna add this to our copper sulfate that's already in the larger bucket. Okay, make sure you start off with a nice clean bucket. That's what you'll mix everything into. All right, here's our copper sulfate already in the bucket. Okay, once you've got your uh, salt and your copper sulfate in your bucket, make sure you grab a stir stick here. And then we are going to add our hot water. You try to get your water as hot as you can because uh, you're going to want to add that and get everything dissolved really nicely before you add your second batch of water and cool it down. So don't forget, this is our five quarts of water. It's uh, as hot as I could get it. I'm going to just slowly add this to our solution. You get this really pretty sort of aqua blue-green color. All right. Set your bucket aside. And now we're going to want to stir that and completely dissolve our copper sulfate and our salt solution until you don't feel any particulate or un-dissolved 
matter uh, left in that bucket. So you want to make sure it's all dissolved before you add your second batch of water. Our second batch of water is going to be just room temperature and that's going to cool everything down. All right, looking pretty good. Notice how it's turned a, a darker, deeper green color um, and there's no solid particulate left um, within that mixture. It's all been dissolved. So now we can add a little bit of cooler water to it. Like I said, the cool water just sort of drops it back down to room temperature or a little cooler. Um, All right, here we go. We're gonna add this cool water to it. And this dilutes it just a little bit. You can leave it concentrated. You don't have to add this second uh, half of water, but uh, if you leave it too concentrated, I mean, it'll obviously etch faster, but uh, it might actually etch so fast, uh, it'll, it'll be hard to control exactly what you're doing. It can also sort of etch and leave a, a little harsher of an edge and an etch to your, your pieces. So um, honestly, I like to just add my first half batch of water um, and then you know make sure it's all dissolved, then add my second batch. And then that second half again just dilutes it so that it's, it's not so harsh, it's not so concentrated. Okay, so let's go ahead and prep our metal so that it's ready to adhere our vinyl stickers to. You would do the same process again if you were going to um, use nail polish or your um, paint markers. You just want to make sure that you got a really clean surface so that you don't have any sort of oils that are going to cause a resist when that etching solution makes contact with it. So I'm going to clean off this whole surface really well with this acetone. So here's our mild steel plate. I'm just going to do a really thorough job of scrubbing it. Get all that dirt residue. Um, something else that you might want to think about too is creating a really nice resist uh, or um, a high uh, amount of contrast when it comes to this etching. So when you etch either aluminum or steel, it's going to leave a, a textured surface that's got a little bit of a tooth in it. So everything that has been um, resisted in terms of that etch... Ah, never mind. Okay. Now we're going to do the same thing with our aluminum. Just clean that surface really well with our acetone. Okay. All right, I'm going to just trim my vinyl down here to fit this tile really nicely. Okay, this will just be the pattern that we use for this aluminum tile right here. So, now that we've got everything nice and clean, all I'm going to do is flip my vinyl sticker over. I've already applied transfer tape, so I'm just going to separate 
the transfer tape from the back backing of this vinyl sticker. And then slowly keep peeling this. Till that's all that's left. All right, so then all I need to do is flip this over and stick the sticker to the aluminum plate and then peel off the transfer tape and then I've got my resist ready to go, ready to be dipped into the etching solution. Okay, now that I've got this separated, all I've got to do is very carefully pick up my transfer tape. Again, I'm still wearing my gloves. Not only after I applied that solvent, I just don't want to add any more oils to my nice clean metal. So I'm going to lay this down, try to match those corners the best I can. All right. And then slowly work from one side to the other. Make sure I don't acquire any air pockets. And then what I like to do, I actually uh, didn't bring my little squeegee up here with me, but if you can just take a, like a credit card or a you know, spackle knife, a plastic spackle knife, or even just a stiff piece of cardboard, just sort of squeegee all those edges down so you don't have any air bubbles. All right, looks great. All right, I usually do one more little tamp. Make sure there's no air bubbles. Make sure everything's really nice and stuck to that surface. And there you go, I've got my pattern and that's ready to etch. One thing to think about uh, when we're looking at this aluminum, which is really nice, see how reflective that surface is. One step that you might want to utilize is polishing everything and getting a really high polish on your metal um, before you etch it. When we etch it, everything that's exposed to that etching solution uh, gets a little textured, it darkens it, and it gains a little bit of a grit to it as it eats down into that. So the higher the contrast that you can, you can kind of generate when thinking ahead and what that etch is going to create, the better and the more that your image is going to kind of pop off. So again, creating that high polish first because all of these areas that have your resist on top of it, again, whether it is something like a, a paint marker or um, you know this vinyl sticker in this case, all of these areas are going to be highly polished and reflective or at least a, a little bit more reflective than everything right here that is currently reflective aluminum, but because that's exposed, that's where your etching solution is going to actually eat into the metal and, and you know create a darker, more textured surface. So just think about that and plan ahead um, so that you get the look that you want to achieve. All right, now we're going to go to our steel tile here. Um, we got it nice and clean, and so we're going to apply our next design to this one. Um, I'm going to go with a vinyl sticker again. I'm going to go with a little Star Wars throwback. Uh, got a little uh, Imperial Insignia that we'll put on this. Um, same process as the last vinyl sticker. This one's already peeling up a little bit. I've already kind of started to separate it, uh, but I've got my transfer tape that's already been applied. I just peel off that backing and then I'm going to apply our sticker try to center it the best I can here looks pretty good good enough for what we're doing okay work from one side to the other squeegee it down make sure it's nice and stuck no air bubbles no air pockets
All right. Now you'll notice that I haven't polished the steel, so we're not going to get a high contrast off of the initial etching. But what I am going to do is show you a trick, a little pro tip, is that with this etching, I'm going to etch everything that the, the sticker's not attached to, obviously. And then what I'm going to do is go ahead and clean it off and spray a sealer on it um, to, while the, the vinyl sticker is still on top of the steel itself. So it will actually protect that area from the sealing um, process when I apply that sealer. So the whole idea is, is then once I uh, remove that sticker, that'll be raw steel underneath that's kind of pushed forward so that then I can apply some solution that starts to rust the steel so that then the etched surface is actually going to be rusted and everything around it that's already been etched uh, is going to not be rusted because it'll have that sealing, that protecting seal on top of it. So um, you can not only utilize your resist and your stickers or whatever you're using as your resist as protecting whatever that design is so that everything around it gets etched um, for the etching process but you can leave that on it after the etching is done and if you're gentle and wash off all your etching solution that that resist will remain most of the time and then you could do f uh, future or further surface treatments and that surface will remain protected then you can remove your resist after that and then that that way you can layer up and kind of um, create more complex surfaces by utilizing that same resist um, for multiple things all right so let's let's go from there all right one other thing that I'd like to talk about is that we need to make sure that we prepare the back of these as well we're only interested in etching the front, or at least I'm only interested in etching the front. So what we want to do is make sure we just put some sort of resist on the entire back surface here, because what we don't want is that etching solution to etch the back of it, um, because, you know, obviously if all you're interested in in the front uh, is, is this design, then that etching of the back of it will exhaust your solution faster and you won't get as clean or as deep of an etch. And then, like I said, you know, it's just kind of a, a waste of, of materials and time. So what I would do um, is, this is why we have our duct tape. Okay. One more thing before we etch this is that we want to prepare the surface um, on the back of our tiles. We're not interested in etching the back of these. I only want to etch the front. So what we want to do is make sure that we cover these back surfaces with a resist of some sort to ensure that the etching solution doesn't hit the back of it. The reason that I just don't want that to hit it besides aesthetics and just really only caring of what's on the front is because that back surface, if it uh, it makes contact with that etching solution, it will it expediate and exhaust that solution faster because it's all the surface area that it's making contact with, including the front. So if I want to kind of, particularly if you want to reuse a solution in your container um, multiple times and you don't want to exhaust it too fast, then you definitely want to limit the amount of contact that it makes with metal that particularly if you're not interested in etching it. So what I'm going to do is just lay this down. This is what our duct tape is for. We're going to just use this to lay a few strips across the back of this and just kind of protect that surface the best we can. Now I'm doing this with my glove still on so that I don't put any oils on my tile. Honestly, it's probably smarter to do this before you lay your design on the front of it. Um, but I was kind of in a hurry and we're going to do it at this point. No big deal. Okay, just make sure that you squeegee that down really well. You got no air pockets, no places for the etching solution 
to sneak into. Okay, let's see if we can get this up. Maybe we'll just go ahead and make the cut right here with it face down. All right, we're ready to go. We got our clean metal right here with our design and, um, on the front of it. We've got our resist on the back of it to make sure the back doesn't get etched. And I've got a little plastic container here with our etching solution in it. So I've made the bigger batch in a large bucket and you don't want to dunk your entire piece into that large bucket um, so that you can keep that concentrated um, solution you know, uh, pristine and untouched. Um, unless you have a large object that you need to dunk into that, just pour off a little bit of that at a time um, into separate containers and do your etchings. That way, you know, this will last for a few etchings depending on how big of an etching you're doing and how long of a uh, exposure to this chemical you're letting your etching sit inside of it. It might last for, for a handful of etchings before you gotta, you know, toss it over into the waste bucket and then proceed forward with some new solution. But again, this way you don't contaminate everything. All you're gonna need is just enough solution to cover the top of your object and make sure that you have solution over everything. So all I've done is just pour a, a thin layer of this in here so that it sits over the surface of this um, while it does the etching process. Now, once I set the object in there, I'm going to kind of agitate it a little bit back and forth and create this wave-like motion the whole idea is that that wave-like motion creates movement of the solution over the top of the object itself because as it starts to etch, what's going to happen is that the, the metal that is actually being eaten off of the surface combines with salts within the solution and what that's going to do is kind of sit on the surface of the object itself. Too much of that sort of scum or slag uh, residue that that sits on the surface can actually impede the etching process and almost act as a resist much like whatever you put on the surface itself so to get a nice clean etch a really fast etch what I want to do is make sure that that um, sort of residue doesn't remain on the surface so that sort of agitation by kind of creating this wave like form um, or motion within your solution back and forth will help sort of distribute that that scum off the top of it. One other thing that I'm going to do um, that I would recommend as a pro tip but also be very careful with this because you can mess up your design if you're if you're not gentle enough is just grab a little chip chip brush and dedicate it to this process um, and as this starts to etch whether you're doing this sort of agitation motion or not every once in a while what you might want to do is go and take this chip brush and slowly brush it across the surface and remove that residue to ensure that you get a clean etch so you'll see me kind of doing both processes with this one last thing is that once you drop this in and it starts to etch it generates a lot of heat um, or, or it can generate a lot of heat. So you want to be careful about touching it or anything like that when you grab it out of the solution. So what I do is I usually just have a stick or some sort of pair of tweezers or something to help get it out. Remember if you're using metal tweezers, chances are they're going to be steel or aluminum. They will also um, get etched or tarnished when you start to try to dip that into the solution. Usually I don't care. You just dedicate something to this process and it's no big deal. But kind of keep that in mind. Also, when you do this, you want to make sure you're wearing your eye protection, your gloves, um, and you want to do this in a well-ventilated space. When this starts, particularly when you see the aluminum hit um, the solution, it's going to be very aggressive. It's going to agitate that surface a lot. It's going to start to fizz and bubble, and what it's going to actually release is a lot of hydrogen gas. Um, it's not particularly bad to be smelling that in, I guess, but I, I wouldn't recommend that it's probably good uh, to just get large quantities of that. So just make sure that you're in a well-ventilated space 
so that when it releases those gases and, and fumes off, that um, it's not too obnoxious. Okay, so here we go. We're going to drop this in to the solution. All right, here we go. All right, so you immediately see the color change that happens. And again, this is aluminum, so it's going to happen very quickly. See, there's one little spot up there. It looks like I had a little bit of oil, so it's creating a little bit of a resist, but it's not too bad. It'll, it'll eventually sort of even out with everything else. Now I'm agitating everything, keeping that etching solution moving. All right. I'm going to get a little closer here, but you can kind of see the bubbling that's occurring, the fizzing. So that happens most of the time with aluminum. You're not going to see that as much or as aggressive with um, or pronounced with steel. Now see all of this, this red sort of residue, that's what I was talking about, that will build up on the surface. So I'm going to take my chip brush and slowly sort of brush that away and continue to agitate it. Okay, it's fuming just a little bit here. Keep agitating it just a little bit. Make sure that that residue doesn't build up too much on that surface. So notice what's happening to the solution itself. It's starting to sort of cloud up and change color. So what that means is, you know, it's starting to expend itself. And this etched metal that is now sort of free floating within it is um, also sort of suspending itself within it. So it's changing the color. But this, uh, when you etch aluminum, the solution will actually become kind of a, a grayish sort of color. And the particulate that comes off of your metal is also going to be this sort of gray, dark gray, brown color. Um, it's, it's red, actually, when it first pops off of it, but then it sort of turns into this, this grayish um, sludge that sits down at the bottom. And then your solution, like I said, slowly sort of um, becomes uh, less and less greenish blue and a little bit more gray. And and then, you know, the less green blue it becomes, that's kind of a nice indicator to let you know of like how much life you've got left in it. Um, if you barely see any green blue left in that solution, then um, you know that it's about expent it um, and it's or spent. So you'll probably have to throw it into the waste bucket and uh, pour in a little bit of fresh stuff. But this is enough to get a really nice etch, just this time right here, because this solution is pretty pretty concentrated. All right, I'm going to pour pull this out and dunk this into some clean water. What I like to do is have some clean water nearby with a sponge so I can wipe off any uh, excess solution. Okay. Now I'm going to try to brush off some of this excess etched metal. And dunk that in my water. You know, very gently just kind of clean that surface and what you'll often see all right so now I've dunked it into this water here and what you'll often see is a lot of this sort of black residue continue to seep out of the metal so what that shows is that that etching solution continues to etch as it sits down within that metal's um, 
surface there. And it's hard, you know, so you want to do a really thorough job of making sure you, you kind of rinse this off and get all of that off because it will continue to etch and corrode that surface if you're not careful, okay? So, okay. Now once you've dunked that in there and washed it really well, clean that surface and get that residue off. You're ready to just dry that off and then you can remove your your resist and see what kind of results you get from that. All right, so our tile is nice and dry, nice and clean now. Um, you could apply a, like, like I said, a spray coat of um, some sort of sealant if you wanted to create, um, you know, differences in your surfaces and seal just the etched portion before the untouched um, portion is exposed from underneath your resist or your vinyl here. But um, I'm going to just seal it all at the same time. So all I'm going to do now is remove my resist. So it's just going to take a little bit of time. To sort of pick this vinyl sticker off but as you can see as a little got to be a little careful here so I don't scratch the metal here that I've spent so much time trying to keep pristine but as you can see when that sticker comes off it exposes that nice untouched metal surface Okay, folks, there you go. Completely cleaned off. You can see how nice of a contrast I've got between that etched surface and the uh, reflective surface of the stuff that was protected by the vinyl sticker. So it's as easy as that. Peel off the back and you've got uh, a piece that's ready to rock and roll. Um, so I would probably seal this with some sort of spray sealant. Um, to, to just make sure that nothing else happens to that surface and I kind of freeze that in place. Um, but let's set that aside. I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the waste, uh, what's left um, once we're done with this sort of etching process. So here is our solution that's left. And you can see that the, the color change has been quite dramatic. It's no longer that really clean, fluorescent sort of blue-green color. It's now this, this sort of translucent um, grayish liquid. Um, you can kind of see that what's on the surface there. It's got a little bit of a green tint to it. Uh, it's probably still has a little bit of um, ability to etch that's left in it. It's not completely spent but we're going to go ahead and dispose of it anyways just so I can show you that process. But this is a good indication of color change that, you know, again, once that gray sediment starts to sit to the bottom um, and it starts to become a little bit more translucent and clear, it's about time to, to kind of, you know, boost it or get rid of it. And when I say boost it, you don't have to get rid of it and start fresh. I like to do that in terms of um, if I'm doing something uh, that's for my own work, and I want to make sure that I get a really consistent etch and that timing is just right. I don't use spent solution very much for those pieces because I want to make sure that I have that timing down really precisely. Um, if you're just doing something that, that doesn't really matter so much in terms of that precision, maybe uh, just a, a household craft that you're etching for something or maybe just a series of coasters or something like that, then I would say, you know, keep using this solution until it completely stops etching then get rid of it just to be um, economically as well as environmentally safe but let's just assume that we're done with this and we're going to get rid of it uh, so I, I take the the brushes and everything and just set that aside let those dry out again we've kind of dedicated those to the etching gods um, and we'll just keep reusing those for this process but that way uh, they're kind of they're not really useful for anything else once it gets this solution in it it's um, 
it starts to eat away at the brush itself as well because I mean you'll notice that it has that metal band on it so it'll start to corrode that as well all right so what I do is I just create uh, some sort of container that I that I dedicate to collecting waste etchant and I just slowly kind of swirl up as much of this particulate as possible and then dump that in now this waste solution what to do with that can be a little bit of a conundrum because it's not super toxic but that uh, copper sulfate uh, or, um, is is a marine hazard uh, it's toxic to the water table and to adding to water uh, so what you don't want to do is pour this down the drain you don't obviously never want to pour it down um, in the gutter or in a river or just on the ground itself it's root killer and so it kills the roots but we it will also soak into the water table so what you want to do is probably get in touch with the uh, local extension of the EPA near you and ask what would be the best way to dispose of this. Um, what I often do is once I get enough of this out, I leave the lid off of this and let it just kind of sit out, particularly in the sun or in a dry environment with a dehumidifier and let this water evaporate out or the liquid component of it so that I end up with nothing but solids. Once it's solids, it's a lot easier to get rid of and dispose of. It's a lot easier to take in, like I said, to your local EPA agency um, that's going to uh, to tell you how to dispose of that better. They, they are able to dispose of those solid components easier than liquid components. Um, so that's why I say just sometimes I, I wait till everything separates out and then I let that liquid evaporate off. Something else that you might want to do too, it's still acidic and that can also be an issue with, you know, figuring out a way to dispose of it. So if you add uh, a few handfuls of baking soda until it neutralizes it, now make sure you've got a bigger container than this when you do it because, you know, you're adding that baking soda to neutralize the acidity of this and it will, just like a volcano in science class, sort of erupt and fizz out everywhere. So what you want to do is just make sure you got room to account for that reaction. But just keep adding that until it stops doing any reaction at all. Then you know you've neutralized it. And then again, I just let it sit out. I let your solid sediment sit down to the bottom. Then the stuff on top becomes a little bit more translucent or clear. I let that evaporate off. And then I've got those solids left. There is a way um, that supposedly you can take those solids and remix it with some other materials and sort of revitalize everything so that it can be recycled and used again. And that would be the optimal way to do this so that you have longevity to this process and you're saving money, but also it's less waste and toxicity that you're adding back to the environment. I haven't really gotten into that yet. I haven't generated that much waste through this process yet to really uh, make that necessary. But ultimately, that would be my goal is to learn how to recycle those salts and that, that uh, solid sediment once that uh, liquid evaporates off so that then I could just remix it back into another batch and it just continues that cycle of etching again. So again, be careful with um, disposing of this. It's not good for the water table, but uh, otherwise I just sort of designate one little container or another bucket to my waste solution and, uh, and then deal with it later down the road. Now we're ready to do the steel etching. I've got the same setup that I did with the aluminum. Got a smaller container here with etching solution in it. Um, just something that'll just fit with our steel. So here we go, we're gonna to toss this in. Got just enough to cover the surface. Now remember with this steel, um, it's going to take you know, at least twice as long, if not longer, to create a good etch on this that we would on the aluminum. It's not as aggressive. You're not going to see the bubbling and the fizzing. What's going to happen though is steel, um, that sort of red scum that, that comes off of the aluminum, it stays red. It doesn't turn gray and dissipate into the water. 
and create, um, you know, just a, a translucent looking sort of um, solution with the, the gray sediment sitting on the bottom. What happens with the steel is that it stays red and it actually clouds up the entire solution. It becomes sort of um, like a, uh, uh, like pond scum almost. It, it looks uh, muddy and murky. And so uh, the, the steel, you're not, it, once it gets really murky, that's its indication that the solution is spent and that you need to dump it out or add more to this to give it some more life. But um, we're just going to let this sit in here. We'll still agitate it every once in a while. I'll come back with a chip brush and do the same sort of uh, technique of brushing off that sediment or that um, scum that develops on top and just make sure that that gets off to the side so that I can get a clean etch. Okay, so here we go. Okay. And again, I'm doing this agitation just like I did with the aluminum. But as you can see, it's not as exciting. It, it takes a little bit longer. You don't really see that immediate change. If you were to grind down into this steel, again, this is just the, the surface of the steel itself, um, only cleaned with some acetone. But if you were to have um, sanded it and polished it or ground it back and, and really exposed that raw steel to the surface, this would happen a little bit faster, but it's still, again, incremental comparatively to the aluminum. So all we're going to do is just let this sort of sit. Um, it'll probably take a good hour before it, it's to a place to where I'm happy with the etch. So we'll just let that sit over an hour. We'll come back and, and check it. And um, throughout the process, you know, don't forget, I'm going to be coming back and agitating it just a little bit and brushing back the sediment to make sure that I get a nice clean etch. All right, well, I'll be back. So here is our etching solution with the steel, steel sample that uh, has been etching in it. Um, I have let it etch for quite a long time, actually. I was discussing previously that um, steel takes a little longer to etch, and maybe you might want to let it etch for at least an hour, you know, maybe more, um, as opposed to the aluminum that works very quickly. Uh, I should have also mentioned too, the amount of etching solution that you put an object into will affect also how quickly it etches. It almost charges itself, so a greater amount of that etching solution will actually work quicker um, just due to that quantity. So because I've got, you know, not very much etching solution in here, it just barely covered the steel piece, um, I ended up letting it etch for much, much longer than what I discussed just so that I could get um, a, a decent etch on it because otherwise after that hour it just really wasn't that impressive. Um, so it all kind of depends and like I said you'll have to kind of play around with the timing so again the concentration of your solution affects the timing of it. The amount of solution that um, is over top of your entire piece and uh, will also affect um, the the quickness and the amount of etching that occurs on your piece. And um, the other thing, remember, is just how clean the metal is. So if you grind that metal back, which I did not do to the steel um, and expose really fresh steel to the solution, it will also speed up that etching process. But so Overall, I let this etch for about 12 hours overnight. Now, the other thing that you'll notice is that the solution is looking very different from what it did with the aluminum etching. The aluminum etching produces this sort of same sort of red, um, you know, scum uh, or the etched metal as it collects with the salts. It kind of sits on top of the metal. Um, but then once we brush that off and it settles to the bottom, it ma mainly turns gray. The solution itself kind of turns this sort of um, grayish color, but it's still pretty translucent and all of your particulate sits to the bottom. With steel, your solution becomes very sort of murky and this sort of yellow 
um, brown color is very typical for that. So that's standard. Um, and when it becomes this color and um, it, it has pretty much exhausted itself, uh, particularly when it's not translucent anymore. So um, th that's a good indicator that that we just need to add solution to it or just go ahead and put this in our waste pile and be done with it. So you can see our steel piece that I've been letting sit in this for a pretty decent amount of time is finished. So I'm going to wipe off the sort of excess particulate. And letting it sit so long, you can see how some of that is even crystallized on top of it. Um, so it's just kind of taking some time to kind of get all that off. Okay, let's pull that on out. Get all that excess etched metal off. And as you can see, that's kind of what we ended up with. Now I'm going to dunk this in water and we'll do give it a good scrubbing. And then you'll be able to see the results here. All right, it's looking pretty good. I've got, you can see some of this sort of scale that's built up, probably just from me leaving it in there for so long. Um, a stiff plastic brush will probably get that off or maybe even a toothbrush. So I'm gonna work on that a little bit, but uh, now it's all good. Now this is all raw steel um, that has been etched. So we wanna try to dry that off as quickly as possible, get some sort of sealer on it unless you want that to rust. But this is a perfect opportunity for us to decide, you know, or, or perhaps you've already decided on your surface for their finished piece. So what you could do is leave this sticker on and you could apply some sort of chemical, um, some sort of acid or maybe salt water if you want to create um, a rusted surface and this is a great time to do that now while you still have your vinyl sticker or your you know paint marker depending on what you've used as your resist this is a perfect time to apply that so that whatever's under the sticker stays protected or whatever's under your resist stays protected and then you can affect the entire surface and then let that do um, whatever it's going to do and then when you remove that resist later uh, you get that nice high contrast between those two surfaces. What I'm going to actually do is try to get this scale off and then seal this while it's still looking rather um, clean in terms of the, the metal and the, and the steel sort of um, natural look to it. And then I'm going to apply a chemical once I peel the sticker up to what has not been sealed and let this rust. So this, what is under the the resist right now that's protected, I want that to rust and have that be the, the contrasting look from the rest of it. But anyways, just think about that. It's a great opportunity to utilize whatever you've used as that resist further within the process and actually before you peel it off, you know, um, use those properties so that you can keep getting uh, variety within your surface uh, surfaces. Okay, folks. I just want to show you the cast iron piece that I'm going to be working on here as a quick sample. This was a uh, casting that was done from a replica that um, I did a silicone mold and then poured a wax and then um, did a lost wax burnout with a sand mold. And so this was cast in cast iron. I, I cast this probably two or three years ago, but... Um, I think it'll be a perfect opportunity to do a little etching on top of this, put a little floral pattern. What I did was I've got half of the face sealed with um, a polyurethane spray, and it was also burnished with a wire brush. 
this other half here on the on the uh, right hand side um, I've sandblasted uh, so I could get it back to some really clean metal so what I'll do here is just to make sure that I get a really nice sort of contrast um, between the um, the etched part versus what's protected by the resist um, I'm going to hit it with a wire brush and kind of just ping it a little bit and polish it up or just give it a, a little bit of a sheen um, and then I'll apply my uh, vinyl sticker which will um, again create that resist uh, the, in, in the uh, shape of a pattern um, that I want uh, to protect the, the cast iron underneath it while it's in that etching solution and then um, it'll be ready to dunk into the etching solution. So one pro tip that I want to discuss with y'all if you're using vinyl stickers particularly on something three-dimensional like this what I would recommend is using a heat gun to sort of melt that sticker just a little bit and that will help um, get it over some of these three-dimensional surfaces particularly these areas that have these complex textural surfaces um, areas that have these harsh transitions if you soften that vinyl just a little bit with a heat gun like I said um, it will roll down um, really easily and then adhere to your piece that much easier so that's a, a tip that um, I discovered as I was etching more and more three-dimensional surfaces um, that that really helped so you know utilize that heat gun don't melt it too much I found that if you hit you know your vinyl for too long obviously it, it actually starts to melt back and your edges start to kind of crinkle and you don't get crisp transitions but if you soften it just a little bit particularly once it's laid over top of this it will stick better and and transition over those um, curves better but I'll show you that once I get there alright so here I go I'm gonna work on this for a little bit All right, folks, so just a quick pro tip. I've got my vinyl resist laid across the top of my cast iron skull here. Um, and if you'll notice, there's some spots that kind of wrinkle and don't stick real well because of the, the texture, um, the complex textures, and the surface that this has to lay across. So this is a perfect time. 
that uh, I would use a heat gun and I'm going to kind of soften this sticker just a little bit, this vinyl, and that way it can kind of stretch and fold across those complex surfaces and those um, really kind of complex uh, curves and, and rough textures so that you don't have any stickers that sort of peel or roll. You want to make sure this is as sealed down as possible so that when it hits that etching solution, none of that solution will actually get under that sticker or the resist that you've got. So when you're using vinyl stickers, that's my pro tip. Hit it with a heat gun and it will actually soften it and, and adhere much better. For example, Just some real quick passes is all you need to do. Just soften it just a little bit and you'll see it kind of melt and then it adheres that much better. Let me focus it just a little bit more here. It adheres that much better to that surface and kind of rolls over it. And you can even see the little bumps and ridges that is in the actual casting itself coming through the sticker you know that you've really softened that sticker you kind of melted it and it sticks down into those ridges and that's good because that is assuring you that it's going to keep that etching solution out of um, all of your uh, resisted area here so that's a that's a really good um, sort of tip to make sure that your vinyl stickers stay stuck down to your three-dimensional surfaces. All right, it's uh, about ready. I'm feeling pretty good about it. I'm gonna to toss it into the etching solution and we'll check out the results after we're done. All right, here's the cast iron casting with all the resists applied, in this case, vinyl stickers. I've used a heat gun to make sure they stick down really well. And now I'm gonna apply the etching solution over top of it. I'm gonna use this bucket I'm going to pour enough to cover the entirety of this object. I've also got just a real quick sort of makeshift hook that I'll be able to reach in and hook this out very easily um, just to kind of save me from having to put my hands in there. But uh, here we go. Hopefully this will, because I've wire brushed and media blasted, you know, the portions that I want etched, um, and we've got some fresh iron exposed. Hopefully this will etch pretty quickly. So here we go, we'll add our solution to it. And you can see the color changing immediately. should be enough okay now we just sit and wait I'm gonna check it every 15 minutes probably brush off any sort of sediment um, that acquires on the top of it from the etching process and uh, you know with this much solution in the past uh, 30 minutes to an hour is um, you know quite sufficient in terms of getting a good etch but we'll check it out and see here in just a little bit all right, folks, so let's go ahead and pull the casting out, take a look at it. All right, so that looks really, really nice in terms of getting a, a good etch. There's lots of uh, slag um, or residue um, that's on it. I'm going to... Uh, kind of try to avoid brushing that off in the solution this go around and I'm actually going to do it outside so that that solution there's just such a, a large quantity of it in there that um, I want to reuse that as much as I can so keeping that sort of debris out of it or that um, spent uh, etched metal out of it I think is important um, so that we can keep reusing this. One other tip that I would give y'all is you know when you've got this much solution and it's still really strong there's lots more etches that I can do with this um, I'm going to pour it back into another bucket through a really fine um, mesh 
and uh, and again that mesh will be like a plastic or some sort of nylon so that I don't actually pour it through a metal mesh and can and you know erode that that mesh or use up some of the the energy that's left in this chemical bath but that way I can kind of sieve out as much of this sort of um, slag as possible and keep it clean and again that will give you know or maintain more life to your etch so here is what we ended up with it's hard to see right now I'm going to brush off the rest of this um, slag and then we'll take a look at it closer and we'll, we'll see what the finished product looks like all right so here's the casting out of the etching bath and it's looking pretty good um, what I did was I went on ahead and applied some uh, chemicals a little hydrogen peroxide some salt water while I had that vinyl sticker still stuck on it um, to kind of accelerate the rusting process and then I went on ahead and removed some of that vinyl so you could see the contrast between the two I'll let that rust naturally and then I'll go back and I'll seal everything to retain this fresh um, polished metal and, and retain that contrast um, I didn't get all the vinyl off but I wanted to peel off what I could so you could see the results came out really nice um, really nice precision honestly so this was just uh, I did uh, about an hour and a half in the acid bath um, and you know every 15 minutes or so brushing back the the slag or the um, sort of uh, uh, etched metal um, corrosion that builds up on it uh, and um, this is what I got it's a very very delicate etch uh, cast iron uh, take is like steel and it just takes a, a long time to etch so this could be something that you could let etch for multiple hours uh, I, you know let it etch for 12 hours um, be careful you know when you let it etch that long you, you start to get a lot of scale that builds up and that's hard to kind of work off unless you're consistently brushing that um, corrosion off or that that slag that builds up but uh, otherwise I'm, I'm pretty pleased with it and uh, so there you go that's that's the result right there alright friends that brings us to the end of our process so I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did good luck with all of your endeavors and don't forget you too can be an etching champion alright take care